Hi and welcome back everyone to our Orboot and RISC-V and Rust hacking streams. So it's uh, been a while and as I told you last time here, I have been at the uh, largest open source developers event here in Europe called FOSDEM. And at FOSDEM there is always lots of people from all over the world, not just Europe actually. And I have met some of the very nice folks from Pine64 and that's why we're looking at this very page here now in their wiki. Uh, which is the page on the OX64. So a little bit of background. At FOSDEM there is usually like six or seven thousand people. Uh, I'm not sure how many uh, came this year, uh, but I can tell you it was very very crowded. And well most of the projects they you know have like one or two tables there and so did the Pine64 folks. And I was hoping that would actually be selling some of the boards but unfortunately, uh, unfortunately they were not. So yeah, I was a bit unlucky with that. Um, but well, I started chatting with them. I told them about the Orbit project and what we're doing here. And I gave them some Orbit stickers. Well, and then they told me in return, uh, well, that was very, very nice. Um, here you go, have an OX64. And so lo and behold, we got one right here. So yeah. Um, the reason why I wanted to buy it uh, there is uh, essentially that if I were to buy it from the US it would cost like 32 bucks for just shipping and that's a bit expensive for you know a very small board that costs like five or six euros maybe um, so yeah it doesn't really make sense um, but yeah so now we got another board to develop on and well the main difference between this one and the one we've been using so far the M1S dock is this one has a slightly different pinout essentially. Um, well, and the other one uh, is already now in a very nice case. So yeah, that's the OX64. Uh, very, very big thanks to the Pine64 folks for doing that. So yeah, we will also feature this board uh, in the upcoming streams a bit more. Um, maybe we will get around to trying it out today actually, but yeah, we'll need to fetch some uh, extra adapters for it because um, yeah, for the other one, I can just use USB in this one here. Uh, as I told you, it has a bit of a different pinout, so I will need some like USB serial stuff or something. Now, some other news. Um, we uh, had a, a dev board program meeting uh, recently, so that's a regular meeting we have with um, RISC-V. And somebody was telling, well, uh, they actually ported uh, another operating system, which is called Oberon, to the M1S dock or well the BL808 SLC. So this thing that you see here that is the very board that we also are working with except this one here uh, doesn't have the shell around it. It's, it's really just uh, the bare board with a display on it. And as you can see uh, there is actually uh, Oberon coming up here. Let's zoom in a bit so you can actually see it here. Oberon V5. I don't actually know exactly much about it. But I can tell you, I've tried Oberon like, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, maybe. Um, so it's been quite a while. And back then it was uh, on like a single floppy on a, an x86 machine. Yeah, quite interesting though, seeing uh, other operating systems also hitting RISC-V now. Uh, not just Linux, also we have uh, already seen FreeBSD. Uh, we have seen uh, Illumos. Somebody already started that and many others. And in fact, well, before we look at this here, uh, let's have a quick look at the RISC-V wiki, uh, because there we have a section on operating systems. I just added a few. Uh, so yeah, just uh, quickly, let's look here at the uh, table of contents. So uh, there is now Android and FreeBSD, FreeRTOS, so that's uh, very contemporary uh, real-time operating system. It's also been used on many ARM devices, so mostly on 32-bit platforms, but yeah, maybe somebody will also use it on 64-bit, I don't know. I guess it's 32-bit only at some point, but yeah, we will see. Now, Haiku, that is also something uh, some people might have heard of. Illumas, I just mentioned that already. Well, Linux, famously. Uh, then Oberon, what I just showed you. OpenBSD already also started work on that. There is a Plan 9 port, uh, well, to some degree. I'm not too sure actually about it. There was some presentation some years ago, but yeah, I haven't really looked into that very much. XV6, something we've already also used on the all winner D1 chip, not here in the stream, but um, 
Yeah, I've already played around with that. And uh, then we have Zephyr. Uh, Zephyr also being uh, more like uh, an embedded system. So yeah, Zephyr is uh, very much uh, in the same space as FreeRTOS. So yeah, um, now this thing here I already uh, showed you very briefly. And uh, well, what do we see here? Um, this here is an upcoming platform by a company called Softgo. I hadn't heard of them before, uh, but apparently they made a very, very nice and large SLC for server grade platforms. So that one here uh, is with uh, 64 cores or hearts, as we say in RISC-V. And uh, what I want to point out to you is they actually started right away with using Linux boot for uh, their early experiments, because that was the easiest way, uh, as somebody said, uh, they could get started. Which is very, very nice to hear, because that's also one thing we want to uh, do with Linux boot. We want to make things very simple and easy to get started with. So yeah, they're using Uroot down here. Uh, what we're also using here for our platforms when we work on, well, the high levels with Linux. Okay, so two more other things I want to feature from uh, Fostim. So there were two talks which might be interesting to you, and both are actually on confidential computing. That is something rather new and recent that is like, essentially, if you've heard of trusted computing, it's like the logical next step or companion, if you will. Um, if you've heard of TEE's trusted execution environment, that is very much in the same direction. So the idea with confidential computing is essentially, if you are on a hosted platform, you want to be able to trust that platform that no other systems on that platform can look into your system. Like if you have a multi-tenant hosting system, like let's say you have a web server running there, and well, you're, you're processing data, for example, right? So you like you have customers or something, um, and then some other people may also be operating something similar. Uh, you want to make sure that you're actually separated from each other. You cannot peek into each other's memory. So yeah, there, there is various approaches for that. Um, one being, well, strong isolation in the first place, right? So <laughs> that is something uh, an operating system or hypervisor can already do. Uh, but, well, another uh, approach is to encrypt parts of the memory. So those uh, different guests that you would then have on the platform, they would all have a different uh, view on the memory with some encryption layer in between. And that would be anchored with the firmware in a way. So yeah, that's... Uh, what Intel did here for uh, a so-called shim firmware. So shim is also what um, some uh, bootloader is called on x86. It's essentially a very stripped down bootloader. Uh, I'm not sure if that is related uh, actually, or uh, they just took the name or they just call it a shim because it is a shim in a way. Anyway, it's written in Rust, so that is also quite interesting here. And uh, yeah, I haven't seen the talk actually. Uh, it was a remote one. Um, and well, unfortunately, I was busy with something else. Uh, but you can find the slides on here, and I will put the link in the show notes as usual. And you can also look at the sources here on GitHub. Anyway, the other one uh, is this one here, and there is already a, a recording online. I've actually seen like the second half of the talk, if you will. Um, that is also uh, very, very similar to uh, what we saw before. Uh, this here is actually referring to TD, so that is Intel's. Uh, so-called trusted domain. They, you know, that is like their marketing term for uh, something that you're supposed to trust that Intel is getting right. And, you know, you as a guest then on their platforms would believe that, you know, uh, you are actually being strongly isolated, your memory is encrypted and stuff like that. AMD is a counterpart, they call it SEV. It's essentially sort of the same approach. And well, uh, they're doing the same thing here with a project called Salos. And that is coming from Rivas, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So yeah, down here you also have the slides and yeah, the speaker. All right. And with that, let's head over again to our very own code here, um, which is for the BL808. And let's uh, quickly zoom in a bit again. So yeah, here on the right hand side, I'm just going to fire up our uh, minicom again. So Minicom is how we connect to the device we're working with. And on the left-hand side here, um, that is actually how we uh, run our code. So uh, we have a command uh, that is called make and then run. And then we would give it a TTY USB device. Well, that's just a USB serial port. So on this one here, USB one, 
This is where the 32-bit core on the platform we're working with is running. And the other one here, that is just a second serial device that we have. So yeah, let's actually see if this code here is currently running. And well, as you could see, it actually is. And I will briefly uh, tell you what happened here now, because that is already a, a few steps further than what we uh, did last time. So first of all, here on the left hand side, um, well, I'm just printing an asterisk now for debugging purposes and, you know, the very first code steps here. And uh, then I'm handing over to the zero on the other side here. So this is where we do our, you know, regular print output. So what do we start with here? Well, Barwood, of course, and the crab emoji. Uh, then we print out some platform details. So that is the platform vendor. This one here is for uh, T-Hat. So T-Hat are making the core or the heart that we're working with here. And then architecture and implementation ID, they are just zero because, um, you know, I don't know, I, I guess they just started with zero. Maybe they will count or something. Well, the heart ID here is zero. And well, we're also printing the board name and the SOC name and something, I actually forgot what it was, I don't know. Anyway, then we're printing some uh, turtle emoji and then dump some memory. So this year, 3EFF quad zero is a special chunk of memory because that is actually where I now put another payload. And this year is now the code that you actually saw running here on the left-hand side where it's now printing C906 and so on. Well, and that is coming from the second core. So in other words, we were actually just uh, telling the other core to continue its operation at this address here, and then just, uh, you know, let it run the execution. So yeah, uh, let's have a dive into how that works, actually, because it's uh, something we just roughly started last time, but it's been quite a while. And uh, yeah, let's, let's see how far we got so far. So yeah, let me zoom in. A, I, I think this here should be okay. So yeah, here on the left hand side, that's where we start. And let's start with the main function here. So first of all, I am doing something slightly different than before. Uh, I'm now using our logger library. That is something we just recently developed in Orboot. And well, then I'm doing a debug print here. And then I'm just printing Orboot. So that is already what we see on the right hand side. And the 42 here, that is the asterisk that we saw on the left hand side. So well, we might as well just do this here. Say we print asterisk as a U8, right? Same thing. Um, oh, well, it says uh, casting a character literal to U8 truncate char. Well, yeah, the character is four bytes, but it doesn't really matter because we actually really just uh, need one byte for this here. Um, maybe we can say as char. I don't know. Well, it already is a char, but we actually want a U8. Anyway, yeah, that's a clippy warning. Um, we might want to turn it off at some point. Anyway, we, we, we can just see in a bit that it's actually really the same thing. Because 42, that is like, uh, we, we can actually also look at the ASCII page here. Uh, let's say I'm an ASCII and then look for 42 and 42. Well, this year, this is now the decimal column, the second one. 42 is the asterisk indeed. So yeah, the first one is octo, then comes decimal hex and the ASCII character. Anyway, so yeah, uh, we were reading out some platform information. That is also what we just saw. So if we go to the definition of that function, it's really just reading the vendor ID, architecture ID, and implementation ID and printing that out, um, plus the board and SLC name. So this these are just constants defined here. Uh, if we go look for it, that's it right there. So yeah, let's just uh, jump back again here. Um, we're then printing out something. Oh, interesting, right. Uh, there is actually a register I discovered. It's called chip information. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what that tells you, uh, but that's, uh, well, uh, this number that we just saw here on the right hand side, uh, this one here. I have no idea what it actually means. Uh, we, we might need to find some documentation on that. Anyway, uh, then come our four total emoji. And well, then we're doing this here. So you see MM entry. 
So we said that MM is the name that they gave the second core. So the second core is a 64-bit core and it's attached to the multimedia peripheral. So they just use MM short for just multimedia. I, I just uh, took the same name so that it doesn't, it doesn't get too confusing. And then we're running this function here and this is now where it gets interesting. We're passing MM entry. This is the entry point for the second binary. We will look at that in a bit as well. Uh, but let's quickly have a look at that function here, resume mm. So what does resume mm do? Well, I took the code that we already looked at before from OpenSBI, and well, I'm just doing the same thing. Uh, here I'm just uh, flushing some caches. Um, I'm not even sure if that is really necessary at this point, but you know, better safe than sorry, let's say. So yeah, I already just uh, used the same code here, just ripped it down a bit. Um, now we're writing the base address that we're uh, using for mm, that is this one here. Um, so we're passing it as entry here and we're writing it to mm base. This is now a register and the mm base register is just this one here. Um, I'm not sure if we have that in the documentation. I don't actually think so. Um, but yeah, you can find it in the example code and also uh, and Samuel Holland's implementation for OpenSBI here. Well, and then we just continue with the system control register for the second core. Oh, somebody joining here. Hey, I want to offer promotion of your channel. No, go away. We don't need promotion. We're the least successful channel in the universe. Nobody will beat us. Huh? Well, no, no idea how, can, uh, how I can moderate this here in OBS. I might actually need to go to twitch.com or something. I don't know. Doshide. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, so what we need to do here is we need to enable the clock and that is how we do it. We read out the previous registers, this control, and then we write back to that register using the previous value and then we do an or operation with this one here. So this here is really just setting one bit. If we look at that, it's defined right here. It's bit number 12. So just setting bit number 12 will uh, get our uh, second core to run. Um, well, now we do this here we also run its reset function. So the reset function is again in a slightly different register. And uh, yeah, again, we need to set another bit here. So essentially we need to do those two things, enable the clock and set the resume bit. And the resume bit, you can see it here. Well, it's actually not a single bit, it's actually multiple bits. There is system reset, power run reset, CPU one reset, and whatever this here is, uh, I already just copied that over. Um, Anyway, those are all the bits we need to set. If you look at the OpenSBI code here, it's slightly different. Um, so this here is uh, setting something like, I don't know, we can actually see. Uh, yeah, get away with the pipe. So yeah, this, this here is essentially uh, doing the same thing just in a slightly different manner uh, by setting a, a negative mask, um, that one here. So yeah, I actually looked at the documentation and saw that, well, I can also explicitly set the other bits instead, which is a bit nicer and hopefully more comprehensible, I think. I mean, not that the other operation is not legit, but all good. Oh, well, somebody is saying they're having uh, trouble with a uh, very low frame rate. Oh. Okay, yeah, right. So recordings always end up on YouTube. So yeah, but thank you for the feedback. Um, since somebody else is writing, uh, I guess it's just fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm currently very much relying on Twitch here for the recording. I'm not doing uh, local copies. Maybe I should at some point. Um, but yeah, I hope this will be okay. Anyway, um, we're doing many sessions here anyway, so yeah, if something goes wrong, we can always repeat or uh, continue. Okay, quality is okay? Cool, thank you. So yeah, um, this is where we're at here now. 
And now let's have a look at the uh, second uh, stage actually. So the thing that is running on the 64-bit core. And uh, for that, let's look at the second directory here. So I'm calling the directories not mm and uh, what was the other one, mcu or something. So instead I call them by the names of the cores. So one core is called C906, that is the 64-bit core. The other one is E907. So currently we're looking, as you can see down here at E907. Um, but we're going to look at the C906 core now. So that is now here on the right hand side. Uh, well, I essentially just dumped a bunch of code in here uh, just to get started. Uh, but we don't really need to look at all of the above because mostly that is just commented out or constants. And as you can see here, um, well, we're just doing the regular initialization that we already did for the other core, except that, you know, now we're on 64 bit. Um, but yeah, what do we do? We just zero out all the uh, essentials like we disable the interrupts, we clear the status register and so on. We set up the stack and well, then we do this here. And what does this year do? Um, that is actually really just the reset. So this year is happening after we ran the main function. So yeah, let's look at the main function because this year is essentially where uh, the operation continues and that's this year and as you can see there's also a bunch of code commented out which is really not too important. Uh, let's make this slightly larger. So what do we do? Uh, <laughs> this year is really just as stupid as can be. We know we already set up the um, UART on the other side here so yeah we just uh, use it right away we don't even bother and we really just print out C906 and then a line break. So yeah, that's it. Um, nothing too exciting. Uh, now what we could do is we could, uh, you know, keep extending that or something. Um, but I actually want to see if we can do something else now. So yeah, let's see. Um, I think it would be interesting to actually uh, look a bit into how we can, you know, uh, get Linux running on this platform here and to get Linux to run uh, we actually need to do a bit of setup again. So the thing is now with the current code uh, we can only use the built-in SRAM uh, but there is also 64 megabytes of DRAM available which is not exactly DRAM. It is DRAM behind the scenes um, but it's uh, called PSRAM that is pseudo SRAM so that means it's actually backed by DRAM but there is a very, very simple and slight, uh, you know, lightweight controller. Um, it's a bit weird to explain. Actually, I haven't really worked with that myself before. So yeah, I'm just picking up information other people told me. And now let's uh, have a look at that. So yeah, let me just uh, pull over my PDF viewer here. Uh, there we go. So yeah, this is the data sheet of the BL808 SOC, the one we're working with. And as you may see, uh, this year is maybe not the one we need to look at. Uh, it might also be this one. No, that one. Right. Yeah, we were also getting lost a bit in documentation. So let's see if we can figure out something about the SRAM here. Well, the PSRAM. So let's look at the table of contents. Do we see something about PSRAM here? Um, I don't. So yeah, let's just search in the document. Let's search for PSRAM. Do we find something? Uh, yeah, we actually do. It's chapter 23. I guess I just missed that here. I know there's, oh, right. It's right here. The PSRAM controller. Right, so how does this thing work? So it says it supports up to 200 megahertz PSRAM clock. Okay, that should be fine, I guess. Uh, there is a register called PSRAM configure. It says go to page four. Okay, I guess that is just the next page here. That one. Yeah. So let's already start with uh, copying out this one here for the definition. So that would be PSRAM configure. So we just put that above here. We can still move it around later. So PSRAM configure is a U size. And the value is this one. 
And well, what does it do? How does it work? Let's see. So, okay, here we have the individual bits described. Okay, so we have the top and the bottom here. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bit angled, uh, but it's readable, I think. So yeah, this is the register description. Yeah, whatever this means, burst boundary shift bit, no idea. Clock free run, sounds interesting. Exibus clock something. So Exi is like, uh, you know, one, one of the essential buses that is connecting the platform. Oh, interesting, Winbond Hyper 3 bus. Uh, Winbond is a vendor for different, uh, like, uh, they make different sorts of storage chips, like, uh, for example, uh, uh, very much uh, famous for spy flash chips, like, you know, in many laptops, you would have their chips, for example, on your main board somewhere. Uh, but also, actually, I think on this board here, um, yeah, that is actually also a Winbond chip. It's, uh, with, with the light here, it's currently a bit hard to show, but you may uh, just believe me. So there is a 16 megabyte uh, spy flash chip on that one. So what else do we have? A 16-bit PSRAM mode enabled. So I guess there is different bit modes. I don't know what the default one would be. Uh, PSRAM register configure grant, okay. Then register, register, whatever stuff. Winbond PS frame register read write selection. No idea what that is. And a bunch more stuff. Wow. Um, interesting. So let's see. Uh, we're looking at, wait a second. This is the first 32 bits. Why does that one say minus one RSVD? I have no idea what that is supposed to mean. And here it starts with 31 again. Maybe this is already the next register. Uh, it's quite confusing to be honest. Maybe it's also an erratum in the PDF that could be, that happens sometimes. Um, RSVD, R ah, that is reserved. Right, ah, I see. So the minus one really doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, I guess we're looking at multiple registers here, but it's really not clear to me where the next register would start. Okay. Huh. Okay, so there is different values here for four and eight megabytes of PSRAM. So we always need to be careful with reading this stuff here. So this is MB for megabytes. Uh, if you see MB with a lowercase b, that would be megabits. Like, um, actually I have that here on the OX64 package. Here it says 128 MB with a lowercase b. And that lowercase b means megabits, so it's 16 megabytes. That's the size of the Winbond flash that I just described. Okay, so I guess the um, it could be that the built-in PSRAM is also made by Winbond. Could be. Okay, so yeah, we're, we're really messing with a bunch of registers here. Um, let's see, how many pages do we have? Mm, that is 15 pages, interesting. So now the problem is uh, the functional description overview and features here, uh, that doesn't really tell us how it works actually. It just says it can read and write the internal registers in memory of various types of PSRAM. Okay. Now we gotta figure out how PSRAM actually works. So yeah, I've never done that before, to be honest. Um, my recording is mirrored. I'm not sure what that is supposed to mean. Anyway, uh, ah, yeah, right, yeah, my camera is mirrored. That is true. Um, I'm not sure how to change it right now, but that should be okay. I mean, you, you can just trust me that it's uh, 128 megabits here. Anyway. So we, we got to figure out how this here works. And in order to figure that out, um, well, let's have a look at uh, OpenSBI, I guess. And that would be Samuel Holland's fork. Um, do we actually have that in here already? Uh, let's see. So we're in my firmware directory. As you can see, I'm doing a lot of projects here. And the uh, 
Buffalo Lab stuff is here in the Buffalo Lab directory. BL808. So, oh dear. There is so much stuff in here. Right. This here. And then there is OpenSBI, but I think that's what I downloaded from uh, Buffalo Lab themselves or something. Uh, let's, let's have a quick look here. Um, oh, hang on. No, no, the whole BL, BL, BL808 directory here is actually a repo. So if we look at that, this here is from Buffalo Lab. Right. Um, but we want something else. We want the code that Samuel Holland wrote. Or we can actually look at that here as well. I don't know. Let, let's let's have a shot at this here first. Uh, let's rip grab for PSRAM. Oh, how unfortunate. Nothing found. Is it a like, case sensitive? Hmm. I don't know. Firmware. Let's search for RAM. Do we get RAM? To be honest, I'm not too sure whether RG is case sensitive or not, but I don't see any reference to RAM. Okay. Um, what files do we have here? fwjump.asm, uh, zero bytes. That looks very empty. Build.log. I'm not sure whether there is a build log file, so I haven't uh, built anything myself here. So I guess somebody checked that in for whatever reason. Um, platform. Oh, wow. Well. Um, yeah, so this year being open SBI uh, means they actually have like all the different implementations in here, similar to what we have in Orboot. Um, so where's Buffalo Lab? I don't see Buffalo Lab in here. That doesn't make any sense. Oh, hang on. It would be T had. Oh, hang on. But in open SBI, they probably don't do the SRAM in it. That is likely in some other directory. Mm, right. Could be the SDK directory. Let's have a look at that. So here, uh, let's rip grab again for PSRAM or SRAM. Uh, like this. Okay, we just found a ton of stuff. Look, drivers. System BL 808.c. Um, looks interesting, huh? Looks interesting. So I guess that is the most interesting part than this year. Uh, we will need this year as well. So this year is the header file with the thing they call GLB. That is like the global whatever. Uh, some some peripheral. It's it's sort of like a GPIO plus some other stuff from what I understand so far. What else do we have here? Uh, TZC, MJPEG. Uh, that is also funny, but not what we're looking for currently. Um, yeah. The GLB.C implementation. Ah, oh, PSRAM clock something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, even more. Oh, look, PSRAM wind bond drive strength, AP math, three clocks, whatever, whatever. Oh, that looks uh, very much like what we also want to look into, right? The PSRAM header file. Okay. Plus more, 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 more. It could also be that there are duplicates in here because it's like, yeah, I don't know what UHS is to be honest. I guess we got to figure that out. So we are looking at this here and we're looking at that. So what do we have here? Mm. M hint. BOR init. PSRAM A. Holy shit's next. Ah, this here is a typical base address for uh, like memory. So I guess we will also find this address in the uh, memory map here. If we look at the System architecture, I guess. Memory map. Do we have memory map somewhere? Not memory management, but address mapping, that one here. Right. Uh, what does the note here say? PSRAM is actually at five lots of zeros. Okay. 
Uh, anything else? So it would also make sense that it's mapped again to eight lots of zeros. Essentially, uh, this address here, PA base. Yeah, would make sense. So what we're seeing here, PMP in it, that is from RISC-V, the uh, physical memory protection. Um, yeah, so this here is uh, commonly done for, uh, you know, protecting your firmware from your operating system so that the operating system cannot mess up anything like when you use SBI. So usually we don't want to have this. So the problem is if we have this uh, set up, then the operating system doesn't fully operate the platform. Um, but yeah, the way most operating systems are currently implemented, which is running in supervisor mode, means that we actually would need to have this isolation here in a way. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's a design issue for now. Okay, what else do we have here? Uh-huh. PSRAM A access set not lock, prefetching barrier. Okay, so this year is 64. Uh, 64, not just 64K, but 64 megabytes, right? 64 million. Um, well, that is our PSRAM size. I don't know what this function here would do, but uh, it's interesting that they're passing it here. I mean, I would probably define this as a constant, but yeah, whatever. It's probably just fine. Yeah, all the system and its stuff here uh, looks very much like RISC-V specific. So like the M status register, what we're clearing uh, initially, for example. Uh, this year, um, T had ISA extension enable, uh, T had ISA EE. That is something very specific. So they have something called MX status. Do not confuse that with M status. So MX status is something specific from T had. Um, that is a special CSR, a uh, control and status register they have. Uh, that is also in the D1 because it's essentially the same core. Um, yeah, I, w I was already messing with that a bit. Uh, yeah, MM is, uh, I think, memory management or something. That is for, uh, yeah, some, some specifics in their MMU. I'm not too sure. Uh, I, I just recall I had to set that bit at some point. Yeah, click, that is the core local interrupt controller. Uh, click int, click interrupter, whatever, I uh, know. Um, get interrupt level from info. Yeah, I mean, we're not really interested in all of that stuff here. Uh, so let's see that we find our PSRAM stuff. Have we seen anything like PSRAM in here? Oh, there, right, right. So these are the two functions that we saw here, the prefetching barrier. I'm not even sure what that would do actually, to be honest. Huh. Okay, let's do the following. Let's uh, run li a little experiment. Um, now we have psram configure, uh, let's say psram base. Let's define that also. Let's see if we can just write to the memory and let's see what happened, right? So that was five lots of zeros. Um, I mean, we, we can dump this register. That is always helpful. Um, right, I see, but let's actually not do it here because on, on this uh, side here, so that would be running on the second core, uh, we don't have much of a setup yet. So let's just do it here on the left hand side where we already have more set up uh, because it's much much easier so we're going to e907 main this year define our concepts here and what do we do well um we read the uh the psram configure register so we call it uh, psram oh, actually we can't use const here I'm, I'm very much used to javascript in javascript we have a const uh but that const is different from here so here a const is really a, a global constant in javascript it just means it's not really assignable um, <laughs> anyway so uh what is this this is the unsafe read volatile 
read, 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 volatile. And we use psram configure as a store mute u32. And then we just print that out. So we just use print ln psram cfg psram cfg. All right. Uh, I put the hmm. Oh, right. Expected semicolon. Found printer then. Or do you want the semicolon? Do you want another semicolon? Like here? No, that wouldn't make sense, would it? Cannot find fun. Oh, yeah, right. We need to import that. So we say use core pointer uh, read volatile. There we go. Now we have it. Uh, if we want to write to it, we can also import the write function or use as we say here. So uh, doesn't implement core format display. Well, mm, how can we how can we do this? Can we just put a hash here or something? Invalid string formatting. Uh, I actually forgot how that works. Can I just say colon x or something? Lower hex is not satisfied. The following other types implement. Oh dear. What is going on here? Mm. Uh, we, we can always do this here. It's just the less elegant way of writing this. What is wrong with lower hex? Huh. We can always do the debug print, like the question mark. I thought we should. Uh -huh. We should be able to do this. Oh, that actually. Weird. Very weird. Whatever. Uh, we will just go with question mark. That's okay for a start. So what is wrong here? Has unit value for further information? Huh. What is wrong here? Is my rest leaving me? Do we need to look at something else? Like some other read volatile. Oh, we're actually not using that here. Um, so get this one here instead. Uh, but there we're not actually reading anything. So yeah, there. Okay. So we say read volatile. Oh, okay. That's already it. Now we can also use the X. Okay, great. Yeah, it's, it's really just about where you put the characters. So this year has a different meaning than this year, because this year essentially means this is now a block. It's marked as unsafe, but nevertheless, it's a block. There is a semicolon here, and that means we are returning something that is coming after the semicolon because that is a statement separator and now there is no statement here which turns it into the empty statement and the empty statement just gives you the unit thing which is just open and closing parentheses yeah that is why we were getting the error anyway so yeah, we, we have to put that here um yeah there are some instances where this is not strictly necessary. 
Um, but yeah, here it is. So we need to have this semicolon. All right, so we can print the PSRAM configuration. Now let's write to the PSRAM memory. So let's say we do an unsafe write volatile. Now we write to PSRAM base as a star mute U32. So yeah, just, just for uh, clarification, um, we need to do this here in order to write to this. Otherwise, uh, you know, we wouldn't be able to change it. It's it's a bit hard to understand sometimes in Rust, but yeah, you, you need to declare everything that you want to change as mutable. So yeah, what do we write to it? Uh, we can just write something stupid like one, two, three, four or something. Uh, five, six, seven, eight, like that. And well, now we can actually write it this way. Doesn't really matter if we do it this way or that way. So write volatile, doesn't return anything. Technically, we can also do this here. So this should be okay, I think. Well, it is because it doesn't give us an error with the next statement, right? So what do we do now? Um, now we can just dump some bytes from the psram base. So let's see if we can just dump the first, I don't know, two bytes or something. So what would we expect? We would expect to see, well, the first half of this here, right? So we would expect one, two, three, four. So let's maybe dump a bit more. Uh, let's actually dump eight bytes. So we would expect to see this here and then either garbage or just FF, 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 FF. Let's see what happens. So yeah, I'm going to run our code again. And as you can see, you don't see anything anymore because I stopped the output here. Okay, so um, we're dumping eight bytes, but we're not seeing anything. So what went wrong here? First of all, uh, this is already a good sign. So we could now see the PSRAM configuration. That's the current configuration. And well, apparently we're failing to read from the PSRAM. We, oh, that is also interesting. We could do the right operation here. It just didn't do anything. Uh, but reading from it, um, well, apparently didn't work. Interesting. Okay. So now how does this actually work? Uh, let's see what we can understand from here. Let's make this a bit wider. So what do we do here? It says access set not lock, set not lock, unset lock, I guess. Um, TCZ. I'm not sure what TCZ is actually. If somebody knows, just write it in the chat. Um, <laughs> so what do we do here? Uh, BL, I guess that is for Buffalo Lab. Uh, WR, reg, write register. That would be read register. And it's, uh, well, just changing some, some bits and some registers. Um, so there's TCZ, TZC, sec base. I have no idea what that would be. Uh, not sure if that is related to security. It wouldn't make sense to me at this point. Um, PSRAM A and TZSRG. And then here we have the same stuff with PSRAM B. Huh. Maybe it's like the SRAM is split up into like two so-called banks. That is uh, a term sometimes used. Um, so yeah, it would be like there would be two spaces where you have RAM. Um, yeah, let's maybe just do the same thing for a start and let's see what happens next. So. Yeah, once a start address and address region. 
and group. So if we look at how the function was used, was passing 0, 0, 0 here, and well, this here. So I guess this here is like start and end. Oh, hang on. And this is A and B, but both of them are getting the 64 million. Huh. I'm not sure what the A and B would do here. I have no idea. It says CPU prefetching barrier, but yeah, I don't know what that means actually. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's search for this register. Script grab. Uh, no. Let's try again. Uh, let's rip grab for that thing. Hello, I would like to have a definition here. Uh, like this one. All right. Oh, right. We actually have that. Do we have that open here on the left? No, that was something else. That was the PSRAM header file. Right. So. Yeah, we actually need that for, for a bunch of things here now. So let's have a look here. It's this one. Hang on, that is the same as TZ1 base. And then there is TZ2 base and NSEC, whatever NSEC, secure and not secure. That would make sense to me either. No idea. Let's copy and paste and see what happens. So let's do that right here. But we can always move things around here in Rust. It's very, very easy with Rust. It's, uh, you know, unlike in C where, you know, you have the header file here and then your implementation there, you know, you can always easily move things around and have everything in one spot. If you want to, you know, split things up, you can start moving things into other files, but it's really mostly convenient. So const tc whatever that is a u size and it has that value and then we have well let's actually continue with this thing here uh well and uh, we're going to do that a bit different now Okay, of course, that is defined in a different file. Thank you very much. Um, that would be hex 380. Huh. Const this thing as a u size, and that is tc something plus hex. Uh, three, eight, oh. What do we do with that? Um, this here. Okay, we need the region. Region was just set to zero. Zero by two, shifted by three. Uh, very much doesn't do anything. This is negation in C, so in Rust we would just use, uh, the exclamation mark and this here huh all of that looks very very interesting I have no idea what it does so let's just let's just copy this here for now um, actually in our case it wouldn't do anything this here would be like all F right and then we would or it with this here, which would be all zero again, because this here is zero, this here is zero. And then we would, essentially we would just write FFFF into this register. Um, okay, and then whatever that would do, PSRAM A TC whatever offset plus region, huh. That looks a bit more interesting and even more confusing, to be honest. So, end adder. That is the 64 megabytes we're passing, right? Okay, let's define a consent for that. 
uh, const psram. Let's call it psram size because that's actually what it is. That is u32 and it's 64 times 1024 times another 1024. Good. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just hard code a few bits here for now. Um, so we will just write Let's actually put the definition here. So we will go unsafe. And now we do a bunch of things. So we write the T, Z, C, whatever thingy here um, as a store U32 mute 32. And we give it the value, well, hex FF, FF, lots of Fs. We can still make this nicer at some point. Um, now this here really looks horrible. Let's see what we can make out of it. So instead of TMP, temporary value, whatever, we just call it V. V is enough. So end adder, our end adder is the PS RAM size, right? This thing here. Uh, start. Okay, instead of start adder, we're going to use. We will actually use. Uh, let's call it start adder as well. And let's say that start adder be zero. Simple enough. Okay, so how about we do this in a few steps so that we don't confuse ourselves too much? Because this here is like, look at this here. This is like four, <laughs> four levels deep. This is pure madness. It's very hard to understand. So what do we do here? So this here, Let something be this. Okay. So we shift PS RAM size by 10. And then we apply this mask here. So that would mean that is the like the higher part of the value. So we call it Huh. This is actually and adder high. So this is like the high part of the end address. For some reason we go minus one. And then we apply and FFFF again. That is really weird. Now we or it with this here. So this here looks very similar to what we had above. So that would be start adder high. That start adder high be this value. Okay, so now we're shifting by 10 for both of them, which means we're just dropping the lowest 10 bits, right? So, I mean, here in this case for zero, it doesn't really do anything. Um, we end, so we do the end operation with FFFF. That means we're dropping all the upper bits of whatever remains here. So if this here were a, well, it is a 32-bit value, right? So we say, um, so we lose the lower 10 bits and then that would mean from 32 bits, 
22 bits remain, then we drop the higher actually we, i mean specifically we, we we would just preserve those bits here so how many bits is that this here is 16 bits right so we also drop the higher six six remaining bits Okay, uh, unfortunately the rest formatter is really nuts sometimes, so depending on, you know, how you order things, I don't really want to have it that way. So we do the same thing for both of them. Mm -hmm. So what we do here is then, uh, we shift the start address, the high part by 16. So that means, um, so the, this is now a 16 bit value, right? Now, if we shift that by 16 bits again, uh, what we get is something like where we have some values like this here, and then everything else is just zero. So let's do that actually in one shot. That would be okay. Or, uh, yeah. Let's do it like this. Let's call it vstart. Uh, let's put it here. So this is now vstart. We do this here. Uh, now we can leave out at least one pair of parentheses, which is a good start. Um, we're doing the same thing here. So this here would be at the end this year. So what this here is, is we get zero, 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 X, 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 X. So yeah, we, we just um, keep the lowest uh, 16 bits here. So essentially, uh, we're, we're, we're like cutting out some, some bits from the middle, not exactly the middle, but somewhere in the middle. Now, what I want to do is I want to uh, change the order here. So we have the start first and then the end. And now we can also do the same here. So V is V start or V end. Damn, this is horrible. <laughs> So this is the start adder. Um, and now here, instead of PS RAM size, let's go and adder. Adder just being short for address, but we don't want to write that out all the time. And and adder be PS RAM size. Good. So now we have this V thing. Um, so what we do is, oh no, we don't need unsafe in here anymore. So we now write volatile, the V to whatever register, whatever register, uh, this, this here. Whatever this is. So yeah, we need to find this, uh, this definition here. Is it in here? No, it's not. I think we already searched for that. So we just need to find that at some point. Um, so what did we have? We have this here, this R0 thing, plus region times four. And this is where we write our value. So how do we calculate? Uh, what do we calculate here? Okay, let's just go with that region B0. That's what we also had in the definition before. Oh, yeah. Now, Russ is saying there is a similar constant definition here. That is why we just get squigglies. We don't really get an error. It is an error, but um, it's like, hey, uh, did you maybe mean this thing here? Uh, Russ is trying to help us here. Okay, how is that thing defined? 
Um, good question. Good question. Oh, hang on. That was the 380 that we had here. Interesting. So we can say const this year is a u size and it's the same as that thing. Okay. So what else? I guess we have the same thing with psram b. Yeah. So if we search for this, right? Let's actually search for the offset thing. So this is 3a8. Uh, Three A eight. I guess we will go with the same thing here. Just make this your B. Yep. Uh that what's wrong with you? Oh. Yeah. Uh now this again needs to be a uh, star mute u32 so we say as star mute 32 but we need to have it in parentheses like this okay great so that was just for writing one value um, I have no idea what it does. So yeah, we, we just keep on doing this. Now, what do we do here? Set enable, but not lock. Set enable, but not lock. Okay. I don't know what we are enabling here, but let's preserve the comments. So whatever this is, oh, let's actually write down here where we took this from. See, uh, this year in BL808 SDK. Okay, region plus 16. So this is or equals, um, right? Yeah, here, here we can still ignore it. Anyway, but, but here it gets a bit more interesting. So, yeah, now we need to read this value here. Set enable, but not lock. So we say that whatever we call it foo for now, uh, or fo, doesn't really matter. Uh, read volatile, read, read volatile as a star mute u32 and now what we do with that is we or it with this here um uh, whatever let's call it control mask now We have to find region up here, so that is okay. Well, we can al also just define it beforehand. Um, well, here's one thing we can do in Rust. We can just use let v. So we can we can redeclare the value. So that is like it's called shadowing, uh, but in Rust it's actually allowed by default. We don't really like that in JavaScript because it also may be prone to errors. But yeah, here in Rust it's. Uh, something they said would be okay. Um, anyway, so we write back that value. So what we do is just, uh, again, um, whoopsie, I moved to some other spot. So we just write volatile. 
Uh, we write back to this control register uh, star mu u32 and we write the original value or the control mask. Nice. Okay, so now let's also do the following. Let's dump the two registers we're changing here. Uh, let's dump the original value. So this here is likely a prepare step up here. I don't know. Prepare question mark. So we say uh, print on. We we print all, and we print the whatever. <laughs> Actually, there is a bit of too much TZ in here for my taste. It doesn't really make any sense. Uh, we print the value as it is. Can we go like colon x here? I think that would automatically do the hex formatting. And then we print it again here. Mm. Right, and then we have this thing here. Um, so Let's also print the R0 register here and there. R0, R0. Okay, let's see what we get. Interesting. Okay, so we did change some value here. Um, we we just added this here. So we actually just changed the control register by adding this stuff here. Oh well. So we had already defined start adder and adder. We have to find region to be just zero. And we have to find, well, we haven't defined group, but group would also be just zero. Yeah, we just assumed the constant here. Well, that's okay for a start. We're essentially not changing anything here, as I understand it. So are we? Actually, we are changing something. Well, yeah, with that register, we are actually changing something. And we're doing that here with this value. And here, we're just not changing anything. It's just the same, right? So this is like before and after our changes. Oh, wow. That was a rough start. But that didn't get us uh, a working memory. This here is also interesting. If you look at this here, there is something about 256 M. I'm not sure if that is now megabits or megabytes. It could be, could it be megabits? So let's, let's calculate. If this is megabits, then how many megabytes would that be? So what is 256? 256 is like, 2 to the 8, right? So 2 to the 10 is 1024, 512 is half of that, 256 is half of that. So this is 2 to the 8. And now if we divide that by 8, that would mean we divide it by 2 to the 3. That would be... I didn't mean to write that. So that would be um, 2 to the 5. And that is 
32. That would be half of our PSRAM size. But do we actually have like more virtual memory? So, yeah, they're saying one shifted by 28. So what is one shifted by 28? Well, one shifted by 28 is very much like two to the 28. It's the same thing. And that would mean it's eight times two to the 20. So two to the 10 is kilo, two to the 20 is mega, right? So this is eight megabytes. Am I getting lost here? No, 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 hang on, hang on. No, no, this is two to the eight. So, sorry, this is indeed, okay, this is 256, 256 million. So this would be the same as uh, two to the 20 times 256, right? So yeah, we still get the same value here. Um, I'm not sure what to make out of that, to be honest. And as I said, I have no idea what this is for. So let's have a look again at uh, this here. It says prefetching barrier. So let's also preserve that comment. And put it up here. Yeah, we could also make this like a full block comment like this. Let's actually do that. So in Rust, you can have nested block comments. Um, and that would turn it into a doc comment. So there, uh, yeah. Then we write it this way with only a single asterisk up here. Okay. Fine. Um, so we, we have done something with PSRAM now. Uh, unfortunately, not very, very much. Um, but as we have seen when we did our search here, uh, there is actually a bunch of things that could be done with the PSRAM. So let's just quickly grab for PSRAM again. So we were looking at this here, systembl808c, and we were just re-implementing this function. Now we could also do that function. It's uh, essentially the same thing, um, except that it's writing to a different uh, register. Um, now this here would be the more interesting part. And as you can see, this is actually very large. Um, it's some hundreds of lines. So for just pseudo SRAM, uh, I have no idea what I would be getting into here, uh, but it says UHS phi. So, oh, look, there is also the basic address. So this is what I also uh, added as a note to the um, PDF. So in the PDF, there was an erratum and I put the note that it's actually five lots of zeros. So this here, uh, the phi initialization, uh, we would also need to re-implement that part. I'm not sure what UHS is for, um, but yeah, in the same fashion as what we just did here, I will just do the very same thing also. Uh, with the code that we see here. Uh, and I will just drop a note. Yeah. Note before using PSRAM, also implement this. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, yeah, we missed the directory name here. It's on drivers. Yeah. CBL808 SDK. And let's do the same thing here. Also implement site in it CBL808 SDK. 
All right. Um, yeah, that should be it for today. We've already uh, been going for quite a while now. So today is a bit special. We'll do another stream later, uh, but we will shift gears a bit and we will look at another project and that would be the Fiano project from Linux Boot. So uh, let's just have a very quick look at that. Uh, to those watching the recording, you might just stop here um, or just watch the next recording actually. So uh, in the Linux Boot project, that is this project here, um, we have some tools that we can use so that we can put Linux Boot into a UFI image, for example. And that same tool is also used for analysis and, you know, just working with firmware images in general. It's called Fiano. And here in Fiano, uh, we have a lot of code written in Go. So if you're interested in that, um, see you again later. And what we will then look into is a few pull requests that are currently open. Yeah, with that, uh, thank you very much. Take care and see you soon. Bye.